Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's sustainability seminar with Dr. Gary Eden. My name is Emily Gusky and I'm a community engagement outreach specialist at Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is a part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We'd like to start today's seminar with the university's land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves in our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Kiankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all of our differences with Native peoples at the core of our efforts. We'd also like to note that all Illinois Sustainable Technology Center seminars are certified green events through the University of Illinois Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment. To find out more about certified green events, you can visit sustainability.illinois.edu. To find out more about ISTC seminar series or sign up for the events list, you can visit istc.illinois.edu slash events. A couple of housekeep housekeeping items. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and that should be available online within about a week. Everyone joining us online will remain muted. And for those of us in the room, please mute and silence your electronic devices. We'll be taking questions at the end of the seminar. For those in the room, you can just raise your hand and be called on, and the microphone will pick up your question. For those online, you can type any questions in the Zoom chat feature, and I'll read those to the speaker at the end. Also, if you're online, you can let me know if you have any technical difficulties through a private chat message. Today's speaker is Gary Eden, who will be presenting on advances in microgravity plasma science and applications. After receiving his PhD degree in electrical engineering in 1976, Gary conducted research in the Optical Sciences Division of the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory from 1976 to 1979. While at NRL, he's co-discovered several lasers, including the KRCL laser and the first proton beam pumped lasers. Gary has served as a member of the faculty of the University of Illinois for 44 years, where 65 individuals have received a PhD under his direction. His research specialties included the discovery of lasers and high power lamps in their applications, atomic, molecular, and ultrafast laser spectroscopy, optical physics in atoms and small molecules, and the science, technology, and commercialization of microcavity plasma devices. Gary is currently the Intel Alumni Endowed Chair in the Department of Electric, Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois and is a co founder of Eden Park Illumination, EP Purification, Cygnus Photo Photonics. EPL Power Electronics and the Eden Park Foundation. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2014. Welcome, Gary. Well, thank you, Emily, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is uh, really a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon, and I'd like to thank the ISTC for uh, the invitation uh, to be here and to speak. Um, before I go on, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my, uh, my co-authors this afternoon, uh, my partner of uh, more than a quarter century, uh, Dr. Sung Jin Park, uh, was able to be with us this afternoon. I don't know if we can get Dr. Park uh, on the camera, but he's a, he's a modest uh, individual. So, uh, but, I, but um, without uh, his partnership, the, uh, the advances that I'd like to describe to you today would not uh, have been possible. Uh, the other uh, co-author of, of this presentation is Dr. Andre Baranov, and uh, he was unable to be with us uh, today. Okay, well, the title that um, I uh, sent to Emily for today's presentation uh, may sound a bit daunting, uh, and I'd like to begin by describing um, what microcavity plasma uh, science uh, might be. Uh, I'm going to uh, then uh, talk about a, a number of applications. Uh, I decided at the last minute to uh, emphasize uh, several of these, uh, but uh, probably not uh, this subject on plasma photonic crystals. Instead, I'd like to um, end my presentation uh, by talking about uh, a very exciting new area that might be of interest to uh, the sustainable 
technology community, and that is um, the uh, realization of uh, nuclear uh, fusion uh, driven by lasers. I think that has it has uh, uh, enormous implications for the sustainable generation of electrical power uh, in later in this century. So next slide, uh, please. Uh, Emily, thank you, by the way, for doing this. What I'd like to do is to begin um, by describing to you uh, what I mean by a microcavity plasma. Plasma, first of all, uh, when I use the term, I'm not referring to it in the medical sense uh, as a, a component of human blood, but rather uh, the, um, the diffuse material of which virtually all of the universe is made. Uh, the sun is a plasma. All of the stars are plasma. So uh, over 99.99% of, of, of everything in this universe is in the form of a plasma. Uh, and it's in that sense that I'm going to be using the term today. Some of you remember plasma TVs, for example. Now, the plasma that I'm going to be um, describing and, and, and utilizing throughout this presentation is known as low temperature plasma or cold plasma. In fact, uh, the temperature is close to room temperature so that if I... Um, uh, have a uh, a plasma device, and I I could bring it up uh, to to your cheek, and you you would barely feel it. That's how um, hospitable I might say it is. Okay, so so what are you looking at here? This is a photograph looking down onto a lamp um, that emits uh, light in the the deep ultraviolet uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, this is unlike any lamp you've ever seen before, because most of us are familiar with the lamps that are in the, in the shape of a bulb, or, or maybe if it's a fluorescent uh, lamp, uh, it is a cylinder, a tube. Uh, these lamps uh, were developed uh, here at the University of Illinois and are now being manufactured uh, in West Champaign. Uh, by a company known as Eden Park Illumination. Dr. Park is uh, the CTO of that firm. Uh, this lamp uh, was uh, pioneered uh, by Dr. Park and a couple of colleagues. Uh, so this lamp is, um, is uh, as you can see, is square. Uh, it may be difficult to tell, but the thickness is quite small. It's only a few millimeters in thickness. Uh, and in fact, this lamp is so... Um, light and thin that a five-year-old could throw it like a Frisbee. Okay, and uh, the microplasmas that I've been referring to are about, uh, well, they're, they're uh, each of these bright lights that you see on the surface of the lamp is uh, a micro a cavity plasma. Uh, these are just uh, spacers. These uh, blue uh, uh, cylinders are uh, wafers. Uh, and uh, the reason that I'm showing you this is that this lamp uh, has, I, I think, um, it may not sound terribly humble, but I think, I think it has revolutionized uh, the production of electromagnetic radiation uh, in a part of the spectrum that's far beyond what we see. As we know, all of us see the... Uh, uh, the rainbow, it's uh, known as the visible, the visible spectrum. And uh, beyond that is the ultraviolet. And uh, the part of the ultraviolet that we're familiar with is very close to the visible. Uh, and it uh, uh, doesn't have a particularly good reputation because if we sit at the beach too long, we'll be sunburned uh, and it can cause other uh, unpleasant uh, effects. Uh, but the wavelength that I'm going to begin talking about today is far far shorter, a much higher frequency in electromagnetic terms uh, than the UV that we're all familiar with. It's, uh, in fact, it's beyond the ultraviolet, and it's at a wavelength of 172 nanometers. And for many of you in the audience, that might not mean a great deal, but let me put it in terms uh, that might be helpful. Next slide, please, Emily. Okay, so uh, I'm probably going to bring back some bad memories of high school chemistry over the next few minutes, um, but uh, I want to begin to give you an idea of just how um, uh, revolutionary, how amazing uh, these, 
this source and other, other lamps uh, like it that we've developed uh, actually are. You're looking at a table of uh, very um, uh, well-known uh, bonds, chemical bonds, uh, such as the bond between a carbon uh, atom and a hydrogen atom. Uh, and that the strength of that bond is known as the dissociation energy and in, in expressed in electron volts, which, which is a unit of, of energy, it's 4.25 electron volts. So these, these bonds are some of the most important in nature. Uh, so for example, the oxygen, ox oxygen double bond is 5.15 electron volts and so on. And uh, many of you in the audience will recognize these, the alkene uh, carbon double bond with, with itself, with, with another carbon atom, is uh, the most energetic of these. Okay, so uh, the lamp that I just showed you on the last slide emits light that, uh, in, in which the photons have an energy of 7.2 eV, and you'll immediately see that uh, that exceeds uh, these bond energies. Well, what does, what does that mean? It, my friends, it is in the ultraviolet that the energy of a single photon matches or exceeds virtually all bond energies. So what that means is, uh, and I, I forgot to say that in frequency terms, the, the bandwidth is narrow. So that means that we can actually enter a molecule or a mixture of molecules, and we can selectively break bonds, shear them, clip them off, uh, in a way that is strategic for whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. So I just wanted you to see that. Next slide, please, Emily. Uh, I could dwell on this. Uh, I'm not going to say much about this. This lamp produces a great deal of power. Could you hit the next uh, tab and you'll see uh, the powers that we've been able to produce uh, from these lamps um, uh, is a about a factor of a thousand greater than what was possible in the past. And you might be thinking, well, that's nice. Uh, that's interesting, but so what? Uh, next slide. Next one, please. Okay. Well, the significance of this is that we, we believe that for the first time, chemical processing uh, at a commercial scale can now be done uh, with photons. Uh, virtually all of the chemistry uh, that has been uh, done or is currently used uh, in industry uh, over the past century has been thermally activated. That is, the chemical reaction proceeds at thermal equilibrium. And what we're interested in doing is driving chemistry far from thermal equilibrium. And in, in other words, doing chemistry in a non-thermal way. In other words, making photons, uh, in a sense, um, a, a reactant in a chemical reaction instead of, let's say, a, uh, liquids uh, or even solids uh, that are heated to certain temperatures. Um, we, we see a future in which photons play a significant role. Uh, we've been able to, using this lab, um, uh, do a number of things, and I'm just going to mention a few. These are a few of the recent publications that describe this work. Next slide, please, Emily. Thank you so much. So I'm going to begin with uh, uh, a uh, series of strange looking uh, images. Uh, what you're looking at are patterns that have been uh, optically or photochemically etched into the surface of a polymer using one of the lamps um, that I showed you a few moments ago. Uh, these, uh, these images are, are courtesy of uh, Cygnus Photonics. Uh, in Champagne, which is a manufacturing of uh, what is known as photolithographic uh, systems. And what, what is a photolithographic system? It comes uh, from uh, the Greek, and it literally means writing with light. Writing with light. Okay. So what we're doing is with uh, a beam of light from the lamp that I showed you a little bit ago coming down through uh, a uh, a uh, a thin sheet of material known as a mask, a photo mask, in which a certain pattern is fabricated. The photons go through that mask and onto a material, in this case, a common ordinary uh, plastic. And you can see that what we can do is make uh, patterns and uh, these patterns are of value both to optics, uh, to photonics, 
uh, but also for medical applications. I, I'll, I'll show you a pattern in just a moment. Uh, this particular pattern is used as an optical grading uh, for spectroscopy. And notice uh, the precision of these, uh, like the widths of these uh, teeth here, five microns, and the height is 240 nanometers, or about a quarter of one uh, millionth of a meter, one micron. Next slide, please. Well, the reason I wanted to show this to you is that uh, uh, having the, uh, the honor of being at the ISTC today, I wanted to emphasize the applications of uh, the technologies that Dr. Park and um, other colleagues and myself have developed uh, by showing you that, um, that with this light of 172 nanometers, we can make very precise patterns in cellulose, which is the most common uh, biological material on this planet. So if we're thinking about sustainability, <laughs> um, I'm sure that, Again, there, there are a number of you within the sound of my voice who are interested in cellulose. So if I could direct your attention on to the right, in particular, these are patterns uh, that were fabricated in cellulose acetate um, with this uh, lamp. And by the way, the, uh, the lamp exposures only require uh, typically less than a minute. And you can see that, uh, for example, we're making we're able to make sinusoidal patterns. If you're wondering about these bumps uh, on here, this is because uh, uh, the uh, cellulose acetate supplied uh, by the manufacturer has not been filtered, and these are particles that are easily removed. So it's it's not a limitation. Uh, of the process. But, th but this is amazing to be able to make things like uh, uh, sinusoidal gratings and so forth. And so they have applications in uh, biomedicine, for example, and I'll just uh, mention one of them. Next slide, please, Emily. Uh, in fact, this, um, uh, if I could uh, draw your attention to this uh, image in the right, uh, this is also a false color image. And by that, I mean that these colors uh, are, are put in by a, a a computer uh, on the measurement tool. The, the, the way that we measure these very, very small depths is with a laser confocal microscope. Um, it, it uses a laser and interference uh, uh, of that laser beam with a surface to be able to measure ex uh, very precisely, very small depths. In this case, uh, you're looking at a somewhat unusual pattern. And this depth right here is 500 nanometers or half of one micron. Okay, and so you can see how clean the sidewalls are. Well, what is this? This is a uh, an early attempt at making a uh, human red blood cell sorter. Uh, it turns out that sorting uh, uh, human cells and, and, and cells of uh, uh, other um, uh, uh, species of animals, uh, in particular, is, is actually difficult to do. Uh, and this is one way that you can uh, do this is structure. We're currently working on a much more sophisticated one. So again, these colors uh, don't mean that these are really, really red. They're, it's actually white to the eye, uh, but this is the deepest part of the pattern, and this is the tallest uh, of the, of the uh, structures. This is uh, just a square mesa, and here's another structure. So you can make uh, an amazing variety of patterns. Next, next slide. So uh, that's the first thing I want you to to notice. Uh, we can also make uh, optical structures. Uh, if you've ever been uh, off the, uh, uh, the coast of New England or along the coast of New England, you've noticed uh, the lighthouses and those from the 19th century uh, invariably had uh, uh, at the top of the tower uh, not only a light source, you know, usually what is known as a arc lamp, uh, but then there was a big, a big lens. It would be several feet in diameter. And it would have a, a ridge structure where you'd have, it was, it was cut into glass, into a glass slab. So you'd have a, uh, an area that was about this wide and then it would drop down and then it would go out to another structure that was a little bit bigger and so forth. So it was, it was sort of a staircase kind of a structure. And uh, we can fabricate that in, uh, in a plastic, in, uh, in cellulose uh, with this lab. Next slide, please. Uh, we can do other things that are very interesting. Uh, you're looking down uh, onto a small um, plate of glass, uh, and you're looking through a microscope, and you're looking onto 
uh, what are little squares, um, or yeah, these are squares, uh, and each of these is made of water. And you would say, wow, how did, how was that done? And, uh, and, uh, and by the way, I can uh, hopefully convince you that this actually is water uh, because you see these, uh, these dark, uh, they're called fringes. These are um, interference fringes. Uh, and uh, what you're, the reason that, that they have the spacing is that you're looking at a drop of water that is taken on this square shape because uh, that lamp that I showed you a little while ago uh, was radiated onto this glass structure before we introduced water, okay? So it was just a piece of glass. We shined light through a mask onto that surface in the pattern of these squares, all right? And what happened was those 7.2 EV photons I told you about actually modify the surface in such a way that the surface is no longer hydrophobic. Uh, you see that it's sort of uh, hidden behind, the title of the slide is hidden behind some uh, uh, computer uh, things. Uh, but the title says VUV induced hydrophilic surfaces. So this surface was originally, thank you, Emily, how, how clever of you to do that. I appreciate that. Uh, so this surface was originally hydrophobic to water. So water would, uh, water droplets would have uh, at the base what they call a very high contact angle. Uh, after you irradiate it with this uh, 172 nanometer radiation, it becomes hydrophilic but only where we irradiated the surface. So that's, anyway, that's why we have these, this array of squares. Next slide, please. So we can make water take on any form we want on a surface. You see a variety of, of lines and notice how the color, this is real. This is actually, uh, I showed you some false color images. This is real color. Uh, and notice this is red and as the line gets wider, it knows it becomes more blue, and that's the way water is. The water off of Maui is, is deep blue. Why? Because it's fairly deep, and water only transmits blue light if it's deep. When it's shallow, you actually can get red light through. So what we're doing is just making wider and wider lines of water. Next slide, please. Okay, we can make a diffraction grading uh, from it. This is, this is a, a picture of light that has gone through, uh, this is a red light from a, a, a red laser, and uh, the red light uh, was directed onto this array of lines that was in the form of diffraction grading. So this is the first optical diffraction grading made from water. So that's why you get these spots. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, these systems are manufactured here in Champaign, and one of the messages I'd like to bring today is that, as I'm sure everybody at ISTC knows, there are some really exciting entrepreneurial um, activities uh, that have been going on now for several decades here at the University of Illinois. And we're very proud uh, to be a part of that. Uh, and this is, you're looking at uh, what is known as the Cygnus X1. Uh, Cygnus is a constellation, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, you're looking at uh, parts of a uh, commercial uh, system. So uh, this one, for example, because these uh, lamps are thin and flat, we're able to uh, tile them, you know, actually uh, assemble them in a pattern similar to the tile in your bathroom wall. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so the next thing I'd like to talk about are the applications of... Uh, uh, this uh, lamp and uh, related lamps in um, in the area of disinfection. This is uh, a photograph of a guest essay that was in the New York Times uh, in, in 2022 during the COVID epidemic. And uh, the story had to do with how to prevent super spreader, spreader events uh, without masks. And the article uh, was uh, written by uh, one, one was a former uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of uh, Health and Human Welfare, uh, HHW, uh, and uh, medical doctor at, at Harvard Medical. But anyway, uh, the, the purpose of the, the uh, article was to write about 
uh, the importance of using deep ultraviolet, not, not the near ultraviolet we're all familiar with, but a deep ultraviolet uh, to uh, kill uh, viruses and bacteria. And this is, of course, uh, a uh, artist's rendition of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the uh, areas that we're deeply involved in, and, uh, and Dr. Park in particular, is in the development of light sources at 222 nanometers. Now, as you can see, this is a longer wavelength than the other lamp I was describing a bit ago. And so the photon energy is a little bit smaller. And you might wonder, well, what, what is significant about this wavelength? Well, it turns out uh, a couple of reasons. One is that we've learned how to produce this uh, this uh, this wavelength very uh, very efficiently in compact thin lamps such as those I showed you a little while ago. But even more importantly, it's been found through uh, collaborations with medical uh, groups around the world, in particular with Dr. David Brenner at Columbia University Medical School. The 222 is is a really important wavelength because it turns out that it does not uh, penetrate into our skin. Uh, virtually at all. Uh, the problem with the UV that, that we all receive when you're lying on a beach is that the wavelength of the light, the ultraviolet, is much larger than this, and it actually comes into your skin and it penetrates down through the epidermis into the der dermis where your DNA is located. And I don't know about you, but I'm not real happy about having UV photons interact with my DNA. So that's why most UV we want to avoid. Uh, but but the, the amazing uh, development of the last uh, five to eight years is uh, extensive number of studies around the world show clearly that uh, this, this ultraviolet, it's called a far UV C, uh, does not penetrate. And, but it's very effective in killing uh, every uh, pathogen you can imagine, including uh, MRSA. Next slide, please. So as a result, um, over the last several years, and this it really, um, uh, this, this uh, uh, introduction of this technology accelerated dramatically, as you might imagine, during COVID-19. Uh, and there are a number of products now that are available, a uh, number of them from our, our uh, company. Uh, and they're being introduced in a variety of places and offices, uh, and I'll show you a few in a moment. These are mostly photographs of products that are available today. Next slide, please. Uh, where are they being installed? Uh, you saw just a moment ago a photograph of a couple of individuals in an assisted care facility um, for reasons that I'm sure are obvious to everyone. We're concerned about uh, bacterial and viral um, uh, contaminants in the air in the uh, and those um, in facilities that care for the elderly. Uh, but these are a few places where these products are located in offices uh, uh, around the world. Uh, this, is a, this is a public office in South Korea. Uh, in South Carolina, they've been installed in uh, the ceilings of high school buses because uh, one study after another shows that uh, the introduction of these, uh, very, these are very low power, uh, sources uh, cause COVID-19 uh, influenza uh, infection rates to drop uh, dramatically. Uh, so uh, there's even a system in the Space Needle in Seattle. There's a one in a bowl and branch in New York City, a hospital in California, and so on. So they're uh, being introduced at a rapid rate. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me move on to a very different uh, type of application, which I hope will be uh, of interest to this audience. Uh, and that is using this cold plasma that I was uh, uh, describing briefly a bit ago, uh, but uh, to use it uh, for um, the um, uh, disinfection of drinking water. Uh, so you're looking at, uh, at left on this, on this slide, uh, a cartoon uh, that shows what we uh, refer to as a, as a microplasma chip or a microchannel chip. Uh, this is a, um, a chip that was again uh, developed here at the University of Illinois and is, uh, uh, has, has been commercialized. 
Um, and uh, I'll describe a few of its applications in just a moment. Uh, this chip is made entirely out of aluminum. You see AL, that's not AI, uh, the, uh, uh, that's not uh, chatbot, uh, chatbot uh, technology, but it's literally aluminum that we all know very well. Uh, and, uh, and with this particular design, we're able to produce cold plasma uh, in oxygen in channels that are about a half a millimeter wide, maybe a little less, sometimes a little more. Uh, but, uh, and this is a photograph of one of these chips actually in operating, operation. The, the blue light that you see is actually light uh, from oxygen, one, one atmosphere of pure oxygen, nothing else in it. Uh, and uh, we're producing a plasma uh, in these channels. Again, they're about a half a millimeter wide, and I don't know how many are here, maybe 15 or so. Uh, and, uh, and that's what's producing the, the blue light. Now, it's difficult for all of you to, um, I'm sure, to, to appreciate uh, why this is an amazing uh, photograph. I've worked with plasmas all my life, and I'll just tell you this, that if you're familiar with... Uh, a standard uh, fluorescence tube. It's about this long, maybe about uh, three feet long, about a, about a meter long, and it has a diameter of about that. Uh, the pressure inside uh, that lamp is about four one thousandths of an atmosphere, very, very low. It's almost a, a vacuum. <laughs> um, and if you try to put an atmosphere of anything in that, and you you tried to turn it on, it would it would break the lamp. It would it would it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be a happy event. <clears throat> uh, but even worse, oxygen is almost impossible to produce a plasma in, uh, and yet uh, we have that ability to do it. So these, these micro uh, channels, uh, microplasmas, uh, have incredible characteristics that allow us to do things we were not able to in, in the past. So uh, the long and the short of it is, is that we can take one of these and stack it with others. Next slide, please. Um, and we can then use them uh, in disinfecting drinking water uh, in various places around the world. So uh, Dr. Park and I have had the privilege of uh, working with others uh, around the world and in introducing these units into uh, areas of the world where they have no access to clean drinking water. I'd like to share with you one example. This is from uh, Kenya, from Western Kenya and the uh, region known as the Kisumu region. Um, and it's a region where there's currently a, a cholera epidemic, I'm sorry to say. Uh, this is one of the first systems uh, that was introduced. By the way, this technology now is in more than uh, uh, 20 countries around the world, uh, from India and the Philippines. Uh, the largest installations are in Kenya. Uh, so so those the chip that I just showed you on the last slide, just take one of them. It's a thin, it's a thin wafer of aluminum. It's about, oh, maybe an inch wide, and it's probably three to four inches long. That one chip, if if we take ordinary room air, just wherever you are in the world, just we have a little uh, fan that that pulls in room air. It uh, doesn't matter what the humidity is, um, wherever you are in the world, but it'll pull the air into these chips. It'll produce the plasmas like you saw a little bit ago, and it produces the chemical known as ozone. Now, ozone, uh, we know um, as uh, something that uh, can be an atmospheric uh, contaminant, but one thing that may not be as well known is that it is the strongest disinfectant that is available commercially. Uh, and so these orange boxes that you see here uh, are um, uh, units that have a single chip of the one that I showed in the last slide in them. Uh, and together, they uh, produce enough ozone on the order of uh, one to two grams of ozone per hour uh, that will disinfect um, at least uh, 2,000 liters of water uh, per day. Now, uh, to put them in maybe put that number in different units, 2,000 liters corresponds to two tons of water, two tons of water. 
so uh, and and you might say, well, how do you how do you disinfect the water? It's really very easy. Uh, you just take the ozone uh, out of uh, these units. They're coming through these tubes, and you bubble it up uh, through water. Um, I I'm not sure, Dr. Park, which one of these. This is the uh, this is the source water, but one of these two white tanks, the ozone comes in and bubbles up through the water. And you can uh, disinfect the water very quickly. So, uh, so again, this is the first one. And uh, the second one, I don't know if we have a slide uh, showing any others. Emily, let's go to the next one. Uh, oh, okay, wonderful. This is the one in Mugruk, Kenya. This is the second system. You can see we're getting a little bit more sophisticated in how how they're built. And, and by the way, I don't want to take credit for this. And, and I know Dr. Park feels the same way. Um, this, this was not possible except for being able to work with two partners. One is an NGO in uh, Kenya known as uh, SWAP, which uh, is an acronym that stands for Safe Water and AIDS Project. SWAP, S-W-A-P, uh, is an NGO uh, and also the University of Illinois at Chicago, their School of Environmental Health. Uh, they, these, are, um, these are amazing people and uh, we feel very privileged to be able to work with them. And uh, underway uh, now, I don't know if we have a slide. Uh, next one, please. Oh yes, I uh, wanted to share this with you. We're very excited about this. There's a third system that's much larger that's now being um, constructed in Kenya and Kopere, uh, Kenya. Uh, and so uh, the capacity will be between 20 and 40 tons of, uh, of, of drinking water per day. Again, I'd like to emphasize that um, this is in an area where uh, they're off the electrical grid and, um, and clean water is simply not available. And river water is very badly infected. Uh, I should also say that just one treatment of badly infected uh, river water, or groundwater, surface water uh, with ozone will take water um, that is unfit for human consumption and, and uh, uh, has caused a lot of public health problems and will take it down uh, to, uh, to better than World Health Organization, WHO standards in, in one treatment and, and certainly well, well below the uh, standards of the Kenyan government. Uh, but this is a, an aerial map of a uh, new uh, a system that's going to be coming in. Uh, it, it's actually under construction now and will be completed later this year, in which water will be taken from a river uh, up into a, uh, uh, a large community of about 6,000 people. Uh, what you can't tell from this aerial map is uh, the topography and that the river which I believe is down here, and we're gonna pump it up uh, several thousand feet. This is on the, the top of a hill. And so uh, uh, the thought of uh, being able to uh, do this uh, is uh, amazing. So, uh, so there are uh, uh, certainly applications that bear on the subject of sustainability. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, I bet 20,000 to 40,000 meter per day do you know how much electricity the ozone generators use? Uh, yes, uh, I'll just say that one of those uh, orange boxes that produces about, uh, what, a third of a gram to a half a gram per, per hour, Sunjin, it requires what? A, a 15 watt. A 15 watt solar panel. So, so, for, so for this one. Uh, 150 watt. Uh, and they including the pump system, they will use about 20 kilowatts to the panel system. So 20 kilowatts is very doable. Yeah. That is the most of the power with the water pumps. Okay, I'm not going to say uh, a great deal about uh, the, the next couple of subjects uh, because I'm I'm already uh, running low on time. Um, and uh, but I, but I do want you to know that um, this technology has uh, led to what, what we regard as breakthroughs in a number of areas. I'm sure that everyone uh, listening to me is aware that uh, a modern uh, GPS system that we have um, that is um, um, made available by a network of satellites uh, in space relies heavily on what is known as an atomic clock. That is, 
Uh, it might not be um, obvious, but uh, when you have a spacecraft that's moving at a high rate of speed, uh, in order to know its position very precisely at any given instant of time, you must be able to measure time to about one part in 10 to the 13. So that's one part in 10 uh, trillion. One part in 10 trillion. Okay, so uh, one of the things that we've done is use these this technology, but with a very, to make very very small lamps, um, and uh, to uh, make a better clock. Next slide, please. We'll talk about. So here's a picture of one of the lamps that were developed uh, in a in a uh, a project with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, California, uh, and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, the, uh, DARPA and the Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA in particular, was interested uh, in a much smaller atomic clock that didn't lose any accuracy in, in shrinking its size. So, so this is a picture of one of the labs that was fabricated, uh, in fact, by Dr. Parr uh, at, um, at a company here in Champaign. Uh, and you can see the blue light coming out. And, and just to give you an idea of the size, uh, this is a U.S. quarter dollar. Next slide, please. So this uh, shows some data for the lamp. I won't take the time to uh, describe it other than to say this is what is known as the fractional stability on this, uh, the y-axis of this curve. And the, uh, the, the data for a, a micro lamp uh, is shown in blue. Uh, and, and you can see that uh, we can get well below 10 to the minus 13. So with this very compact lamp that consumes only a fraction of a watt in power. So the bottom line, folks, is, is that we're now able to make uh, atomic clocks that have a volume of only one liter, one liter. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about something that impacts uh, all of us more directly. Um, uh, we've also developed uh, a plasma uh, technology. Um, I think uh, maybe uh, in our listening audience today is Dr. Monroy, who uh, uh, is one of the uh, uh, one of the, our incredible partners uh, in this, um, and Dr. Uh, Stephen uh, Bopart uh, here at the University of Illinois, working with uh, with them as well as uh, Helen Nguyen in uh, environmental engineering been able to develop a, a technology uh, that um, has the uh, a strong potential to uh, heal a human ear infection. So you're looking at a cross section of uh, the human ear, the ear with a, uh, this is a cartoon uh, version, uh, and the, uh, the human eardrum is here, and infections in the middle ear, ear occur in, in this region, uh, and the problem in the past is that uh, the only way to uh, treat uh, ear infections in children, for example, and, and by the way, over 80% of children worldwide have at least one ear infection uh, in their, uh, in their uh, childhood years. Uh, and the problem is that uh, the infections are occurring uh, on this side of the eardrum, so access to the infection is uh, problematic. Um, what we found is that with plasma, uh, because it's so gentle, we can produce uh, atomic uh, and molecular species, literally atoms and molecules, that will, will travel through the eardrum without damaging it in any way. We've, we've been studying this for some time now and can find no damage whatsoever to the eardrum. And we're, we're actually conducting these studies not on, not on humans, uh, that, that wouldn't be uh, uh, ethical to begin there. Uh, we're actually uh, doing it with uh, a, a small animal. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, it appears that uh, these species go through the eardrum without uh, uh, hurting it in any way, and they destroy the, uh, uh, the pathogens that are causing the infection on the other side. So that was another application I wanted you to know about. Next slide, please. Okay, I want to conclude. Uh, I'm, I'm actually getting into negative time now because uh, uh, Emily is going to start glaring at me in a minute. Uh, but I'd like to finish uh, with just a few uh, slides about 
um, an application of uh, plasmas and lasers that um, many of you may not be aware about aware of. For many years, uh, about uh, six decades actually, scientists have been interested in producing um, power and eventually electrical energy by the same process that the sun produces power. That is by taking two hydrogen atoms and forcing them together. Uh, they don't want to uh, form a molecule, but if but if we uh, put enough uh, temperature and pressure on them, they will do that. And that's how the core of the sun produces power, okay? Just the sheer mass of the sun creates a very dense and high temperature core. Well, uh, about five decades ago, a number of individuals thought about creating those solar conditions with a laser. And the reason that I'd like to share that with you today is that um, in the last year, uh, we finally reached uh, a, a, a dream has come true, uh, that in a laboratory in California, a laser directed onto a target made of, made of hydrogen, a hydrogen pellet, was able to produce more power from fusion than the laser actually delivered to the target. So it's producing net energy, and I mean a lot of energy. Um, now this, this demonstration, as amazing as it is, is, um, uh, is a research, it's a research project. It's a big, big research project, but it's a research project. And you're looking at, uh, at parts of that system. Next slide. Um, but I'd like to share this with you briefly because this uh, center, the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center is devoted to, as the name says so clearly, sustainability. Uh, and there are a few things that um, that humanity has thought of that would be more sustainable than using uh, hydrogen uh, to generate uh, electrical power. So I'm just gonna show you this slide because I think it's very interesting. It was, it was supplied to me by a colleague uh, who is uh, well known in this field. You're looking at the uh, front end of an oil tanker, okay? So the oil tanker um, will hold uh, 900,000 tons of, of liquid. Usually it's carrying obviously oil. But let's suppose that instead of oil, we fill this tanker with water. Why water? Because from water, you can extract hydrogen, and in particular, a heavier form of hydrogen known as deuterium. In fact, from, from all the water inside this, that, that, that would fill this tanker, you'd get 40 liters of deuterium. Now, that doesn't sound like much, 40 liters, um, but from that deuterium, you can breed an equal amount of tritium, and then you can irradiate it with a laser. There's the sun right there. So we're gonna fuse it, but we're gonna, instead of doing it the way this, exactly the way the sun does, we're gonna have a laser that's shining on to this little tiny pellet and it's going to explode. And that energy uh, from that 40 liters of deuterium will produce as much energy as in the tanker's oil, which is 340 million liters. From 40, liter, 40 liters of deuterium, it produces much as 340 million liters of oil. But the big payoff is you do not, if you do it that way with fusing, you do not emit 200,000 metric tons of CO2. So uh, I'm just here today to tell you that uh, the first experiments have been done. Uh, let me just go through a couple of slides uh, real quick uh, and then we're gonna call it a day. So, uh, so what we're doing uh, here at the University of Illinois is starting on a system uh, that uh, is based on, a, this is, a, this is a, a cartoon drawing of the National Ignition Facility in Livermore, California. Uh, our, our group here at the University of Illinois is starting work on a laser uh, that is smaller than this and will be more efficient than that. Next slide, please. 
This is a uh, photograph of the target chamber at the National Ignition Facility. You can see how massive it is and how expensive it is. I think it costs several billion dollars to build this facility. But, uh, and that's why the real work is beginning now, my friends, uh, because our task now is to take a very expensive research system and make it uh, a commercially viable technology. And that's what we're working on. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think I'm gonna skip over this. This just tells about what happened. This was a, uh, a cover of the, um, the journal Science. And it talks about the explosion marks, laser fusion breakthrough. To the, it announced the uh, the development. Next slide, please. So, uh, in that experiment, um, there were uh, there was three hundred million joules of energy stored in capacitor banks, and uh, eventually got three point five megajoules of fusion energy. When only about two megajoules came from the laser. So there was a 50% a uh, increase in output power. But the problem is, is that you started with 300 megajoules and you end up with three. So that's why the, the hard work of designing uh, a well-engineered system that's efficient um, uh, can be deployed uh, commercially. Next slide, please. Next slide. Let's get keep going. I don't think uh, because of time I'm going to talk about. Let's let's keep going. There's um, if I had more time, I'd talk about the details of the uh, system. The uh, average power will have to be three to 10 megawatts of power. Next slide, please. So this is a key efficiency criterion that the product of the efficiency of the laser multiplied by the gain given to us by the fusion target must be greater than 10. This is a picture, by the way, of one of the arms of the NIF laser facility in California. So you can see we're far from having a, a sufficiently compact and efficient system uh, to deploy in a power plant. Next slide, please. Let's go all the way, to, I think, all the way to the end, since I'm out of time. Let's keep going. So we're working on a type of laser that's already uh, been commercialized. It's uh, used for the LASIK eye uh, refractive surgical uh, procedure that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, and we're just building a, a bigger system. Next slide, please. Let's, let's keep going. Okay, so this is a system that's uh, going to be under construction actually in the Denver, Colorado area uh, that uses a particular type of ultraviolet laser that, it, that has been pioneered here in Illinois uh, to, to drive uh, uh, targets that are located in a target chamber down here. Next slide, please. And one more. This is, this is a ultimate, um, um, this is an artist con a conception um, drawing of uh, a commercial plant uh, that we expect will be built uh, by the mid 2030s. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank you so much for your patience and time today. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to be here at ISTC. And I hope that I've convinced you that uh, plasmas and, and, and lasers based on plasmas uh, really do have a number of exciting uh, applications in sustainability. And I think, I think there's a real potential, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, make life better for humanity in the coming decades. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and like I said earlier, we are now open for questions. So if you know more in the room, you can go ahead and just uh, say it out loud. And then um, for our virtual uh, attendees, you can drop that question in the chat. Any questions to be getting yet? Otherwise, I have one that I can start us out with. Um, I think one interesting thing that you talked about is working with the NGO um, on the Kenya project. And I was kind of wondering, what was it like building that relationship with the NGO to kind of do this project? Yeah. Well, Emily, thank you for the question. I. I can't take credit for that. I'm probably not the right person to answer that question. Uh, 
Uh, I'll, I'll give you just a, a wee bit of history. The NGO uh, that I mentioned is SWAP, Safe Water and AIDS Project. Uh, they've been um, in operating in Kenya uh, for well, decades. Song Jin, would you say maybe at least uh, 20, 30 years, I would yeah. say. Oh, yeah. nice. And as the name and plot, the acronym implies, uh, they were formed primarily to combat the AIDS uh, epidemic, uh, particularly in Central Africa. Uh, but as time has gone on, they've become more interested in, in water. The water uh, situation is terrible uh, in uh, Africa and a number of areas in Southeast Asia, uh, South America, a number, number of places around the world. So uh, they found out about the technology that Dr. Park uh, and I had developed here at Illinois. Uh, and they contacted uh, Dr. Park uh, and, uh, and in particular, Professor Sam Dorovich, who's a professor uh, in, uh, in the environmental sciences at, uh, at UI Chicago. So it turns out they're a joy to work with. They have strong, um, a strong relationship with the Kenyan government. So, um, so the the red tape and you know the bureaucratic uh, issues that that are sometimes faced uh, by others, uh, you know, elsewhere around the world, uh, uh, we we haven't faced. We haven't uh, faced. They, they seem to be uh, just really um, uh, they're just wonderful people to work with. So. Um, so that, that means that we've been able to, um, uh, I mean, we're responsible only for the disinfection technology. Uh, that's, we're, we're grateful to, to be able to uh, uh, supply that. But it's really made a difference because the way that we disinfect our water, our drinking water in the United States is mostly with chlorine. And we do that because it's inexpensive. But if you're, thinking about a community that's off grid or maybe there aren't even good roads, how are you gonna get chlorine to that? And if you're if you're successful in getting chlorine there by truck or whatever, um, that's not enough because you have to do it periodically because they run out of the chlorine. The nice thing about ozone is you you make it from your own, your own, your own air. And after the ozone is uh, spent, it either reacts, kills uh, uh, pathogens, um, but the unused ozone reverts back to uh, oxygen, the oxygen we're breathing right now. So it's, it's taken from O2, it's made into O3, and then it goes back to O2. So it's, in our view, it's the ultimate green, uh, environmentally safe technology. And we do have a couple of questions in the chat. So the first one is, incredible range of topics, fascinating work. So generating plasmas in or for water purification, is that done inside a liquid environment or sprayed at it as it flows by? Uh, one great question. And, and I, I'm sorry, I went so fast through, uh, through these subjects. I uh, apologize to the audience, uh, wherever you might be. Um, so the answer to the question is these little chips that we show, they're made, they're made from aluminum and a, uh, a series of processes I won't bore you with. But anyway, uh, when we're done, there are these uh, channels that are about a half a millimeter wide and about that long. And what we do is we introduce oxygen, uh, air, room air that we're breathing. Just take the room air and we force it into the channels. And across the channels is uh, an electric field. A, vol a voltage has been applied. Uh, because the uh, the channels are so narrow, we don't have to uh, apply much voltage. That's the other nice thing, because inside these little orange boxes, we have a rechargeable battery. So the whole uh, everything works at twelve volts. Uh, so uh, so the answer to the question is we produce a plasma in a gas, and then the gas is transported through those white tubes you saw up to the bottom of a tank, and it's introduced into the tank. Uh, through uh, what is called a, uh, a stone, uh, stone diffuser, similar to what we use in fish tanks. You know, people who uh, have fish, uh, the, uh, the, at the bottom there's a, a diffuser and it produces small bubbles. And the, and the trick is to make the bubbles as small as possible so you have maximum surface area. But anyway, that's it. It just, it goes up through the water and you do that for typically 20 minutes all it takes kills all the bacteria 
Okay, we've got another question on the chat. Could the HG lamp be mated to a white LED to make an inexpensive white light source with a four a 546.1 nanometer wavelength spike superimposed? Okay, uh, well, that's an interesting question. It, it, and, and it's interesting because uh, uh, I talked about the uh, ultraviolet emitting lamps that um, um, are, are being um, manufactured. Uh, Dr. Park uh, is playing a big role in that up here in Champaign. Uh, but uh, the company and the history of the company before we started making UV lamps, for a number of years, we made uh, flat white lamps, white emitting lamps. And so they were flat and made them as big as one foot square. In fact, uh, the light from them was so, uh, I'm, I know I'm biased, but the, the, the white light is so so beautiful that uh, these lamps were sold into the cinematography industry. I mean, literally Hollywood uh, being used as, as lamps for uh, what they call fill light uh, on, on, uh, on set lighting. Uh, but... Uh, because the UV engine that drove the lamp was so efficient, the company pivoted and decided to go to UV. But anyway, to answer the question, uh, we we wouldn't do it with uh, mercury uh, making white light. Uh, we actually um, use uh, xenon gas. Okay, it's uh, if if if, if uh, our uh, listeners are familiar with the uh, periodic chart. Uh, there the gas is over on the far right, okay? Start with helium and go all the way down to uh, actually uh, xenon and then radon. Uh, but xenon gas, if you uh, produce a plasmid at a high pressure, it produces uh, ultraviolet light very efficiently. So then we convert that to white with a phosphor. So the 546 nanometer line that the questioner is asking about is a line emitted by atomic mercury. It's green, but it's narrow, okay? So it doesn't make white light, it's green. So if you wanna make white light, uh, you have to take, um, you, you have to start with UV ultraviolet and produce the primary colors, red, blue, and green. Then it'll look white to the human eye. So that's what we did. And we have any other questions from our audience here? No, I think I put everybody to sleep. <laughs> I don't think that, <laughs> but maybe people are hungry for lunch if they have a half yet. Um, well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and I, like I said earlier, this will also be recorded. So feel free to share this with anyone who might be interested once we get that uploaded on the website. Um, thank you all to our attendees, both virtual and in-person, for coming, and we do have some more seminars coming up in March and April, so keep an eye out for those, and have a great day. Thank you, Emily. Thank it's you. an honor to be here today. We've got some clapping emojis also. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you all.